Three, two, one, boom. We're live. What's up? You guys good? Awesome. Praise the Lord. Hey, we're in a series called The Interrupters. We're looking at the men and women uh, that brought heaven to earth, um, with the exception of tonight. Tonight, we're going to be talking about everybody's least favorite disciple, Judas, and his not so impressive. Well, he's, he's definitely a step up from Judas, but uh, Judas and um, Matthias, okay? And so we're going to spend most of our time on Judas, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we know about Matthias, which is basically nothing. Um, okay, so now, why would we even spend a week on Judas? Like, why would we even talk about him? Like, shouldn't we just skip Judas? And uh, no, we can't skip Judas. Why? Uh, Because this whole narrative of Judas and his place amongst the 12 is not an isolated story. Um, This is not something that's contained just within this period of church history, that this place of being called and not really yet chosen is a part of the dynamic within the restoration of the supernatural gifts of the church and even today. How many of you know, have kn- how many of you have known incredible supernaturalists that walked in amazing power and had all kinds of opportunities, okay, to really come into something amazing and yet they screwed up royally? How many of you, that's you? <laughs> Just kidding. All right. I, I looked down. I'm not looking around. Um, yeah, you guys, you know, this whole thing of like incredible opportunity. Like uh, Judas was one that actually like lived with the son of God, Jesus, right? For three years. Okay. And, um, and yet his story uh, doesn't end well. And uh, we're going to study, you guys, we're going to study some people. Um, well, I'll tell you what we're doing. We're studying the 12, the 12 apostles. Okay, and I, we're going to be looking at some other cats like um, St. Paul. Okay, um, we're also going to be looking at Barnabas. And I also want to look at the deacon, Stephen. Okay, so I've, I've, added, I've added a few. And I think that's going to be really great. Um, and then what we're actually going to look at, we're spending a whole week on the conversion of Constantine. And the moment that Christianity went from being an underground group of lawbreakers to being the national religion of Rome. This, this time when this thing went from being incredibly organic, okay, and, and all about community and relationship to becoming a corporation, okay? And we're going to look at many of the things that we're railing against in the church even to this day because of the great Roman acquisition and the merging of paganism with Christianity, okay? Um, however, we're going to find out that there was a remnant, even in that era of great compromise, a remnant of wild supernaturalists that sought God and found him and continued to bring heaven to earth. Okay? And then we're actually going to fast forward and we're going to look at the restoration of the spiritual gifts within the church in the late 1800s through 12 of God's generals. We're going to look at Mariah Woodworth Eder, the woman who would trance out for days while she was preaching, literally frozen in position as people would come from miles around just to observe the frozen woman. (laughs) Yep, we're also going to look at Catherine Coleman, Amy Simple McPherson, John Alexander Dowie, Smith Wigglesworth. We'll be looking at um, John G. Lake. Yeah, Uh, We're going to be looking at some fascinating uh, generals. And then we're going to fast forward and we're going to look at 12 modern day supernaturals. People that are still alive today that God has used to pioneer a mystic supernatural realm within the church. So it's the interrupters. It's the men and women who God has used as a major pattern interrupt to religion in order to see the prayer of Jesus fulfilled, that his kingdom would come, that his will would be done, on earth as it is in heaven. All right. Well, here's an interrupter, okay? Uh, And not necessarily a positive interrupter. This is Judas Iscariot, okay? Um, Now, 
people in Bible times, they didn't exactly have first and last names like we do today, okay? Uh, which is why, you know, even Jesus Christ, okay, that's not his name. It's not Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what people that aren't saved think his name is, you know? They get ticked off and they're like, yeah, 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 okay? Using his name in vain, but that's not actually his name. Christ, okay, is a description uh, for Jesus. It means anointed one. He is Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed one. So here we have Judas Iscariot, okay? And um, what does that name mean? It's a, it, could it be a description? Names can mean a lot of things. It could come from a title. It could come from a father's name. It could come from a group that they're identified with, just like we looked at uh, Simon the Zealot, okay? And so um, here's what Judas Iscariot means. We have no idea. <laughs> Scholars don't know what Iscariot means. There's a possibility that it could refer to the town that Judas might have come from, which is uh, the town of uh, Kerioth, which makes him different from all the other disciples in that he, the Judas, came from uh, Judea instead of from Galilee, which all the other disciples uh, came from. But we don't know if there's a direct tie between where he's from and his— I, I'm sure you guys are finding me really helpful tonight. I'm asking you really big questions, and then I'm like, yeah, not a clue. <laughs> I hope you're taking notes. All right, awesome. There's also a very popular theory that his name, uh, Iscariot, um, could identify him with a political group of Jewish rebels known as the Sicarii. Okay? Um, who knows where the Sicarii is found in the Gospels? Okay, then. All right. Acts 21, verse 38. Paul is being interrogated. And they ask Paul, aren't you the Egyptian who led a rebellion some time ago, some 4,000 members of assassins out into the desert? And he's like, no. <laughs> like, dude, how would you like to be accused of being a leader of 4,000 assassins? That'd be kind of an honor. Aren't you the one with a tribe of 4,000 assassins? My answer would be, maybe. <laughs> that's, just, that's just awesome. That is just... Okay, not, not that the Sakari were, were awesome. These guys, these guys were crazy. Um, these guys were known as the Dagger Men. Why? Because they wore really cool jackets like this one, and in their jackets would be daggers, <laughs> just like me. Cool. Um, they would hide daggers, just kidding, um, in their jackets. They would disguise themselves. They would blend into the crowds. They would use stealth to assassinate high-ranking government leaders and Roman sympathizers. <laughs> okay, that's this is not a good thing, okay? Even though it would make for a great movie. Awesome. All right. This was, the Sicarii were the earliest assassins guild, predating the Islamic Hashish, uh, Hashishin, okay, which is where we get the video game Assassin's Creed, which I just wanted to put a picture of Assassin's Creed on the screen behind me. Okay, that's where that video game uh, comes from. This also predates the Japanese ninjas. Okay. For the record, it also predates the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So, um, yep, no, it's true. So, this Jewish group of, of assassins, okay, this is the very first assassin's guild that we know of. And there's the possibility that Judas might have come from that group of assassins. Good times. All right. And who's on your leadership team, right? A tax collector, some fishermen, and him. <laughs> a dagger man. You got a dagger man? What? You got a dagger man on your leadership team? Well, he was a dagger man, but he's a new man. Yeah, he looks like a new man. All right, good times. D <laughs> yeah, all right. So now um, Judas Iscariot, that, his name is always spelled out, Judas Iscariot. They always say it, why? To separate him from the other Judases in the Bible. There are many Judases uh, on record um, in the Bible, including Jesus had a brother named Judas. Incredibly awkward, especially at Thanksgiving, after the resurrection of Christ, right? 
you know, they're like, bro, we got to come up with a new name um, for you. Judas Iscariot, yep, was one of the 12. Um, the Bible says that uh, Jesus would call the disciples unto himself. Interesting, when it comes to Judas, this is one of the disciples that we don't have record of Jesus actually summoning and asking to follow him. So we don't actually know the recruitment of Judas. How did this guy actually get invited to be a part of the 12? All we know is that we are given the list of the 12 disciples and Judas's name is added in the list. Also kind of interesting that his duty, okay, was to be the treasurer, okay? So that was his job description. He was to take care of the finances. You're like, well, what about Matthew? Wouldn't he have been more qualified to be the treasurer? Well, tax collectors were notorious for stealing funds, okay? And so tax collectors are amazing accountants, but these are like black hat accountants, and they they're always, you know, hacking stuff for their own personal gain. So it's like, Matthew, we love you. We believe that you're redeemed. You're a new creation reality. <laughs> we just don't want you to be tempted. So let's keep the money bag away from Matthew. You know, we do, it's not that we don't trust you. We love you, Matthew. Could just be a stumbling block, okay? Remind you of old times. So they put somebody a little bit more trustworthy. <laughs> Sketchy Judas to be the treasure, okay? Man, it, it, it's so easy to point the finger and be like, man, what were they thinking? But man, how many times have we heard this story in the church, okay? Again, this is a story that just um, repeats itself. Now, Judas was uh, not just the treasure, um, he was also a thief, Okay, so before he ever betrayed Jesus, um, it was known about him that he was a thief. John chapter 12, verses 4 to 6 says, But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, um, he was about to betray Jesus, said, Now, this text that we're reading was written a long time after the betrayal of Jesus. So this is not a prophetic word of the betrayal that's coming. Um, this was written uh, quite a long time after the betrayal of Jesus. So, John, the beloved, is recounting this incident, and he said uh, that Judas had a question. Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii, denarii and given to the poor? This is, right, such a waste of oil. Why is it being poured out on Jesus' feet? Don't, isn't it funny that Judas knew exactly how much that oil was worth, Okay. Most likely, if, uh, if Judas was on the price was right, he would always get it. You know, what's the value of this refrigerator? And he's going to know it. He just, he knows, he knows his stuff. He's well, he's well read. Okay. All right. Red flag. All right. Okay. Um, you know, they're like, look, look at the way that Judas watches that money. It's like Gollum, right? My patient. Okay. Good times. All right. He said this, look at this, not because Judas cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. So before Judas ever betrayed Jesus, he was already embezzling church funds for his own good. This is part of the reason why people believe that Judas was at least partially motivated by greed when he betrayed Jesus. He had a history of theft, and so when he saw the opportunity to earn 30 pieces of silver for handing over Jesus, he took it. Interesting. John chapter 17, okay? That is the actual Lord's Prayer. A lot of people say the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, that's when Jesus is teaching his, his disciples how to pray. It's like that moment in The Sound of Music, my favorite film, when all the children ask, what's her name? But we don't know how to sing, right? Teach us how to sing. And she's like, okay, this is how you sing. Do a deer, a female deer, gray, a deer. Okay, this is a horrible example, by the way. Um, anyways, the disciples are like, Jesus, we don't know how to pray. We have been with you so long. Teach us how to pray. And Jesus is like, pray like this. Oh, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy can come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
yes, forgive us. <laughs> I'm just okay. Man, I hope this service gets better. Okay, here we go. So the actual, the actual, Sunday nights, my favorite service. You guys are my favorite. All right, John 7, we got to stop streaming them though. John 17, okay, John 17, 12. Um, this is where Jesus, we get to eavesdrop. We get to, we actually get to hear um, one of the intimate moments that Jesus is actually talking to his dad, actually praying. This is really intimate because we don't, we don't really ever get to listen to those private moments between um, Jesus and, and his dad. And um, in John 17, we get to actually hear how Jesus prays. And Jesus is just like, Dad, Dad, you know how like you are in me and I am in you? You know how like, you know how we get each other? Like we're, there's no competition in, in us. There's, there's no jealousy or rivalry. There's no sense of self-promotion. Dad, you know how you love me so much, and I just, I just love you so much. Dad, I got, a, I got a request. My request is that my 12, that they would be in us, and that we would be in them, and that we would be so unified. And, and here within this, this, this prayer for unity, we see that it says, 1712, while I was with them, I protected them. I kept them safe by that name that you gave me. And look at how Jesus prays. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus is saying here, that he is aware that there is one amongst the 12 who's totally lost. And he calls him the son of perdition. This means eternally damned, doomed to hell, trapped in unrepentant sin, thus never to receive forgiveness. We see this phrase also used in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, where it refers to the man of lawlessness, which many Christians identify as the Antichrist. Not somebody that you want to have something in common with, and not somebody that you want to have on your leadership team. When Jesus says, so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, he's referring to a prophetic word given from David in Psalm 41, verse 9, where David prophetically frames out, as he does so many times about the life of Christ, even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who has shared my bread, has turned against me. Psalm 109, verse 8. May his days be few. May another take his place of leadership. In Acts chapter 1, verse 20, Peter suggests that Psalm 109, verse 8, was about Judas. And the 11 remaining apostles would appoint someone to take Judas's place. So we see that Judas betrays Jesus. Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16 says, Then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? And they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. During the Last Supper, Judas leaves early, and Jesus and the rest of the disciples head to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. Jesus asks the disciples to be watchmen, okay? If you were here this morning, it was an awesome message. If you weren't here this morning, you missed out on an awesome message. <laughs> so awesome. So good. Good thing it's on YouTube. But they kept falling asleep, and when they finished, Judas approaches with an armed crowd and points Jesus out. Matthew chapter 26, verses 45 to 50, 
And then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. And while he was still yet speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived and with a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. And Jesus replied, Do what you came for, my friend. Then the man steeped forward, then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. What happened here is interesting because the opponents of Jesus, they were looking for an opportunity when they could arrest Jesus. The problem is that wherever Jesus went, there were large crowds of followers. There were lots of uh, Jewish sympathizers. There were, uh, uh, and, and they were, they were really hoping, you know, that Jesus was going to be, uh, yes, the Messiah, but also the immediate deliverer the Roman slayer, the Roman butt kicker, they were hoping that at any moment Jesus was going to say, now is the time. Run and you may live. Fight and you may die. But right, that's from Braveheart. That's the wrong script. But they were, they were hoping that Jesus was going to pull a Braveheart and Jesus did it. Jesus was always like, listen, when somebody hits you on one cheek, give them the other cheek and let them hit you. And they're like, who is this guy? I thought this was the Messiah. I thought this was the Redeemer. So a time would need to be found when Jesus was isolated, when he wasn't around the crowds of people, a time would need to be found when Jesus could be sieged and arrested and there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be a, a reaction that is triggered. Why did Judas betray Jesus? Yep, we already talked about most likely he was motivated by greed. Matthew 26, verses 14 and 15 says, Luke and Matthew, uh, sorry, it says, what are you willing to give me if I were to deliver him over to you? Right? This is what Judas says to the priests. If I were to give you Jesus, how much would that be worth to you? And they said, 30 pieces of silver. Luke 22.5 says that the chief priest agreed to give him money. And this was implying that Judas had suggested it. But we also know that there wasn't just this greed factor, but we also know that Satan had entered into him. We see in uh, Luke 4.13, Luke and John both write that Satan entered into Judas and influenced him to betray Jesus. At the end of Jesus' temptation in the desert, Luke says that the devil left Jesus until an opportune time. The Judas provided both the time and the opportunity, and Luke records that it happened just before he spoke with the chief priests, and John writes that the devil prompted him to betray Jesus before the Last Supper. In John chapter 13 verses 26 and 27, Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread that I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Is Iscariot sorry. Um, as soon as Judas took the bread, look at Satan entered him. So why did Satan do this, Right? Didn't Satan know that Jesus was going to die, okay? That this was a part of his prophetic assignment. Here's the thing. Satan thought that killing Jesus would ruin everything. Yep. And perhaps like the Jews, Satan thought that the Messiah was supposed to restore God's kingdom by conquering the physical and political powers of this world. So by killing Jesus... Satan thought that he would prevent that restoration from occurring. But the crucifixion, what the devil thought 
was his plan was actually a part of God's sovereign plan to provide the forgiveness and remission of sins to all people. Think about that for a second. Think about that for a second. Even the things in your life that the enemy thought were his idea, God has the ability, okay, to pattern interrupt the most devastating satanic plots within your life. That only our God, only the author and finisher of our faith has the ability to hijack the plot line of Satan himself. Yeah, that is, that is just, you know, never give Satan too much credit. We serve a great big God with a great big golden feather pen. And there's nothing that he loves more than to pattern interrupt satanic plots so that he can be glorified through what the enemy thought would be the most humiliating part of your life, the most disgraceful part of the most disqualified part of your life. And God is like, I can work with this. My God. First Corinthians chapter two, verses eight and nine. No, everyone say no. No, come on, say it like, say it like you mean it. No. no. We declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him. Throughout his ministry, Jesus would drop these hints to his disciples, these little hints that he was going to die. And during the Last Supper, the gospel writer tells us that Jesus knew exactly how he was going to die, and he knew who would betray him. Okay? In many accounts, okay, Jesus blatantly tells the disciples who would betray him, and yet, somehow, they missed it. The disciples, they're like, what, what? You know, this is one of those, this is one of those moments. John 17, 21, 21. Okay, Are you, I, I didn't even, that wasn't even English. Sometimes I get excited. Okay, all right, good. No, John 17, okay, 21 to 29. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in the spirit and testified. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. Immediately, all the disciples are what? I mean, all this time, I was like, right? One of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another. They just began scoping each other out. They were just like, they were like, it's Peter. I know it's Peter. That dude, I've never trusted him. It's Matthew. That's smug. Look at Matthew. He's just always got that weird tax collector look on his face, right? They're all just, they're sizing each other up, right? They're staring at one another and at a loss to know which one of them he meant. And by the way, here's a clue. The guy that looks like this. <laughs> All right. Just saying. Okay. One of them, the disciple, okay, who Jesus loved. We talked about John the Beloved. Okay. Was reclining next to him. Uh, here's a famous painting of the Last Supper. Okay. And here is John, you know, laying his head, okay, on, on, the, on, 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 the, on the bosom. <laughs> So I like to say that word, of Jesus, laying his head on Jesus' chest. And I, and I love this because we talked about this. We, we talked about John the Beloved, right? We talked about like the intimacy, the, the moment. Like, you know, we talked about that tonight. Like John, John just was like, I, and I am looking for the place where I can lay my head upon your breast. Just totally ruined that song. Um, so this is, this is what's happening here. And it was actually Eric McCoy that came up to me. He's like, you know what was happening there. That's not, you know, th this is not John being like, and I want to hear your heartbeat. No, no, no. This is Jesus saying, okay? This is Jesus saying, one of you cats is about to betray me. And this is John saying, you tell me who it is. This is John leaning in, putting his head, like getting all up in Jesus's space and being like, Bro, you tell me who it is. We will take care of him right now. 
Yeah. Interesting theory, Eric McCoy. I like it. All right. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, look at this, leaning, you know, leaning, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Right? Yeah. And look at what Jesus answered. You want to know? Okay, I'll tell you. Like, Jesus, who is it? Jesus is like, okay, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, I'll show you. I'll show you right now. I'm, like, I'm just going to make it just in plain sight, you, you know, Judas. <laughs> like, yeah. like, huh, he must not, you know, who, I still don't know who it is. Like, like look, at, look at this. <laughs> Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I give this piece of bread. And when I've dipped it in the dish. So everyone, this is what they know. <laughs> I'm going to tell you who's the, who, the one that's going to betray me. I'm going to take this bread. I'm going to dip it in the dish. And whoever I gives it to is, is the one. So he dips the piece of bread, and then who does he give it to? Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. And as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. Okay? Meaning that none of those guys had any discernment. <laughs> Satan himself just came into Judas, and they're all like, I don't get it. That's such an interesting clue, Jesus. I, I don't, give us another clue. It's the dude that Satan just possessed in front of your eyes, right? So then Jesus, Jesus looks at Judas and says, what you're about to do, you better go and do it quickly. But no one at the meal understood what Jesus was saying. <laughs> Since, no more comments. I, I want to make more comments. No more comments. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought that Jesus was telling him, uh, what he needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. So Jesus is like, whoever I give this bread to is my betrayer. So he, he dips the bread, gives it to Judas. He's like, all right, dude, go and do your deal. And they're all, and they're all sitting there like, huh, even this must be going to run an errand for Jesus. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> We see that Judas regrets betraying Jesus. One of the chief priests found Jesus guilty of blasphemy, handed him over to Pilate, and Judas has a change of heart. What's interesting is that in Matthew 27, verses 3 to 5, when Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. He said, I have sinned, for I have betrayed innocent blood. Okay. What is that to us, they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Fascinating text here, fascinating text. And I, I appreciate um, Tom Cornell over at uh, Sozo Church. Um, as I rescued as I rescued, as he rescued me, and I wrestled through this text um, about Judas. And Tom pointed out something very interesting to me this week. He said, look at what he repents of. He repents for betraying innocent blood. What's he, what's he saying there? He's not acknowledging that Jesus was the Son of God. Lord, Emmanuel. His only repentance is that he's betrayed an innocent man. What does that mean? For three years, okay, he followed Jesus. He saw Jesus do the stuff, but he never actually got it. That moment of revelation that this is truly the Son of God, that this truly is Emmanuel God with us, that to Judas, Jesus was a good man, a great man, and most likely, if it's true that Judas came from the, uh, from the Sakari, if it's true that he came from a tribe of violent rebel assassins, it's possible that he had hoped that it was just a matter of time 
till Jesus led the great rebellion and the great uprising. And when Jesus did not satisfy his political angst against the Roman government, that he at that time, out of greed and possession by Satan himself, betrayed Jesus for money. His only confession is that he had betrayed someone who had done nothing wrong without any sort of admittance to who Jesus was. Interesting, right? So how did Judas die? Well, we see in Matthew chapter 27, verse 5, that Judas threw, him, threw the money into the temple, and then he left, and he went, and he hung himself. Matthew 27, verses 6, and 7, 6 to 10, the chief priest picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this money into the treasury. It's blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 pieces of silver, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used it to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded. Luke writes in Acts chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, with the payment that he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field, and there he fell headlong. His body burst open, and all of his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language the field of blood. The book of Acts opens after the resurrection of Jesus, and while the apostles are waiting for the Holy Spirit, they get together to talk about the need to replace Judas. Again, Psalm 109, verse 8, may another take his place of leadership. So Peter says, here we go. The apostles wanted to choose someone, um, and, uh, 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 and they came up with two men. Two men got nominated. We had our business meeting today. Uh, we had a bunch of, of our members come, and we talked about the church. We talked about what Jesus did last year. We talked about our finances. We kind of popped the hood as some people got asked uh, some questions. Okay, we see here that the church, the first century church, they have a business meeting. And they're like, We've, Judas is no longer an elder here. Okay, and we need to replace him. We need a new elder so two men get nominated. Joseph, called Barsabas, also known as Justice. And then there was Matthias. They prayed, and then they played dice. Okay? They prayed, and then they flipped a coin. That was, they, they cast lots, which was the one acceptable form of divination that they were allowed to practice. Good times. How would you like that if you were here at our business meeting and we're like, hey, we're going to be um, choosing a new elder today. So we're going to be presenting two elders. We're going to pray and then we're going to flip a coin. All right. Eric, you get heads. Okay. Steve, you get tails. Here we go. Shing, ching. Heads. It's, <laughs> yeah, good times. So what they come up with? Matthias. Yay, ladies and gentlemen, Matthias. He's going to be replacing Judas. Yay, everybody celebrated. Yes, Matthias. He's so awesome. And they installed Matthias, and then we never heard another word about Matthias ever again in the Bible. Except we do have a painting of him. Because the Catholic Church has paintings of everybody. Good times. So that is actually what he looked like. Brandon, kind of looks like you, dude. I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Matthias, come on. I love you. Love you, B. <laughs> All right. The six o'clock, my favorite. Here we go. So, many people, scholars, when they read this, they actually think that perhaps the timing was off in the early church. Why? Because there would be another apostle that would have such significance in the early church 
And is it possible that they should not have replaced Judas with Matthias? Is it possible that the man who is known as Saul, who after post-conversion would become known as Paul, is it possible that Paul the apostle was supposed to have been Judas's replacement? Not sure. It's, it's, in, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Or possibly, Paul was Judas's replacement. And the Lord was like, you can pick whoever you want, but I'm going to be the one. You can flip a coin, but I've got someone that I've chosen. I've got someone that I've chosen. Josh, can you come, bud? I reached out to Pastor Greg. As you can tell, I was, I was kind of struggling with this thing of Judas. So I reached out to all my friends. I was like, you got to help me. And so Pastor Tom reached out to me. Pastor Greg reached out to me. And um, we see, this is a text that Pastor Greg sent me. Matthew twenty two fourteen. Everyone say, for many are called, but few are chosen. Greg said, Judas was like the other 12 disciples who was called. But who makes the choice whether you are chosen? This is, this is what Greg asked the question. Many are called, but few are chosen. Who's going to make the choice in your life on whether or not you are chosen? This is what Greg says. Here's the sober answer. You do. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21 says, But in a great house... There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood, clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. You know, we, we went through uh, a time here at SRC when we made a hire and were certainly impressed by this leader. And man, we we're building with this guy. He's with us for a, for a few years. And then after actually over time, there was some red flags, okay? Listen, you got to pay attention to the red flags, we, we had a conversation this last week with the Renaissance Coalition. We had over 50 ministers on our very first Zoom call. So awesome. Ministers and their spouses. And we, we talked about the importance of, yep, hearing God, but also hearing your gut. There's times when God's going to speak to you, and then there's going to be times when you cringe. And you say, that didn't feel right. In my uh, Evernote app, I've got a folder and it's called the red flag folder. I've also got a folder for when God speaks. I've got a God folder. There's a dream folder in there and a prophetic words folder in there. And you crazy people at SRC, you guys have been dreaming like crazy. You've been sending me your dreams. I'm going to share some of them with our, with our elders tomorrow night. You, you guys are a prophetic are prophetic people. I, I was getting some stuff even this morning from people in our church. I got some stuff from people in our church even after the service uh, texting me a, a vision. And, and I put it, I, I put it somewhere. Because that's how, you, that's how you steward the prophetic. That's how you, that's how you steward discernment. That's how, you, that's how you grow. You say, I don't remember my dreams. It's because you never write them down. When your gut goes off, when your spidey sense starts tingling, you need to write it down. I write it in my red flag folder. And what do I do? I pray into it a little bit. Sometimes I'll talk to Andrea about it. And then I'll circle back around and say, hey, you, you said something. What, what did, you, you said this. Da, 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 da. Here's the data. And this is how it made me feel. What did you mean by that? You didn't know that a sermon on Judas was going to be so practical, did you? Hey, repeat this after me. This is what you said. Come on, everybody. You, you need this. Trust me. This is what you said. 
This is how it made me feel. What did you mean by that? It's not worth it. Yeah, relationships are always worth it. This is what you said. This is how it made me feel. What did, what did, what did you mean by that? So there were these red flag moments that were coming up. And finally, I had a conversation with a, with a pastor over in uh, Pasadena. And I was telling him, I got all these red flags. I, don't, I, try to, I, bring, I, I bring it up. I, I'm doing confrontation. I'm confronting this. But I just, I just don't know what to do with this, with this guy. And this is what he said to me. He said, this man's not in alignment with you. His heart's not in alignment with you. And that's all you need. You don't need evidence. You don't need it. All you need to know is that his heart is not in alignment with your heart. It's like Bill Johnson says, until you know and love and serve my vision, I'm not really concerned about your vision. Bill said it, not me. Anyways, um, I sat down with this, with this guy. I said, bro, I, you're done here. You're not working here anymore. This is your last day. And he, and he said, and he started crying. He said, what, what did I do? I didn't know. I didn't know. And this wasn't my, just my decision. A process with our elder team. Submitted all this to our elder team. We just processed, right? We prayed and sat down and just said, we're not in alignment. We're done. Only to find out months later that some stuff had been happening within that ministry. And it was, it was embarrassing. And, and it was like, I trusted this guy, right? I put this guy in a place of a position and this guy totally, totally betrayed me. He totally betrayed our leadership team. He, he betrayed our church. And we're like, how do, you deal with, how do you deal with betrayal? This is what I know. If you haven't been betrayed, just wait. Just wait. It's just, yeah. It's not that this is like our expectation that one day someone's going to betray me. Like, I'm not trying to get you to set your faith up. You're going to be betrayed. But most likely, to a certain degree, every single person in this room has probably been betrayed by someone. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you what's difficult. When an apostle betrays you. I'll tell you what's difficult. Judas wasn't just some ordinary guy. He was one of the twelve. Not one of the 120, not one of the 70. He was part of the inner group. Okay? And he had an opportunity to be transformed just like the rest of them. Guys, they were all screwed up. They were all messed up. Hey, guess what? That's what we have in common with the disciples. We're all screwed up. Yeah? And guess what, though? Over time... They would repent. Over time, they would get new understanding. Over, over, over time, they were growing and they were, they were changing. They were going from this place of just being screw-ups to this place where they're actually looking and sounding more and more like Jesus. But on Judas, Judas had an opportunity to repent of his sin. But when he accepted the money, when he kissed Jesus. As Greg said to me, when Judas kissed Jesus, it sealed the physical death of Jesus. It's called the kiss of death. But it also sealed the eternal damnation for Judas. Here's the truth. Jesus loved Judas. That this was not some predestined great plan that we don't subscribe to duck, duck, damn, okay? That's Calvinism. <laughs> some of you God created to go to heaven, and some of you God created to catalyze hell, and some of you God created to burn in eternity forever. We, sorry, I, I just, I subscribe to verses like, for God so loved the world. <laughs> Call me a weirdo. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten. Paul said, I preach. So that every heart would be awakened to their identity in Christ Jesus. Judas had an opportunity to repent of his stuff and to receive mercy.
So many people, they, they actually turn their backs on God. When men and women of God fail God and they say, I trusted this leader, I trusted this pastor, I trusted this apostle, and because they failed me, God failed me. I, I trusted him, I trusted her. And when they sin, I determined at that point, I will never trust again. This is the enemy's, this is the enemy's plan. And listen, if you've had somebody in the church, if you've had a pastor that failed you, that betrayed you, if there was a great man of God, a great woman of God that sinned against you, that promised you something and then didn't deliver, that manipulated you for their own, for their own, for their own selfish gain, for their own selfish ambition. Listen, I'm sorry. I am sorry for sinning against you. I am sorry for betraying you. I'm sorry for offering things to you with no intent of ever giving it to you. I'm sorry for seeing you as just something that I can consume for my own gain. And as a leader in the church, as a pastor, I would like to ask whether you're here in the building or you're watching online, I'd like to ask that you would forgive me. If that's you, you were hurt by leaders in the church. Would you forgive me? And if so, would you respond by saying, I do, I forgive you. You're like, no, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say it. It's not that easy, Pastor Darren. You can't just say, I forgive. It's not that easy. You can't just forgive. Yeah, you can. And, I, and I'm sorry. And listen, I get it because I've been hurt by people in the church. I've been disappointed by people in the church. I, I, I was completely done. I was completely just done with the church. Like, why waste your time at all? Like, please, please. The church? <laughs> yeah, no. No. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. You have to forgive. Why? Because of Jesus and because of what he did on the cross. Because he has forgiven us of so much and we didn't deserve it. We didn't, we didn't pay for it. That, that good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. And that forgiveness has been paid for in full so that anyone who believes in their heart and confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord can be forgiven of all their sins in a moment and, and get, a fresh, get a fresh chance. And so if you who have done nothing, nothing at all, if me who doesn't deserve any forgiveness at all, if God is just all of a sudden just forgiven me despite me? Like I haven't, I haven't proven myself yet. I haven't had a, a, an opportunity to be like, like to show even the fruit of repentance. Like all I've done is just been like, Jesus, I believe in my heart. I, I'm a screw up. I'm a mess up. I, I, I've done some stupid, stupid stuff. I've been so selfish and I've, I've lived for myself. And, and you mean to say that in one moment, God will just forgive me of everything? And then who am I if I've been forgiven of everything? And by the way, I've been forgiven of everything. And if I have been forgiven of everything, then who am I to withhold forgiveness? Who am I who has been forgiven? Let out the hook. Like, like, I don't have to serve time in spiritual jail. Who am I to keep you in spiritual jail because of my self-righteous angst? No, no, no. No, we have to forgive. And we don't have to feel the forgiveness to know that it's real. In the same way that you don't have to feel your salvation to know that it's real. So people say, I just don't feel it. No, no, no. That's not how this thing works. It's, it's, it's the, the, in the kingdom, the dynamics of the kingdom activate by faith, which is the substance of things hoped for and yet not yet felt, not yet seen, 
not yet experienced. And if you're here tonight and you're like, Pastor Darren, I want to forgive you. I, I want to forgive. I want to be able to release this. I want to be able to say, I forgive you. And I release you of all. I want to be able to forgive my last pastor. I want to be able to forgive that, that other church I was a part of. I want to be a part of that person that abused me. I want to forgive that person that molested me. I want to forgive that person that accused me. I want to, I want to forgive, but I can't. But I can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Why? Because there's grace tonight. There's grace tonight to do what you could never do in and of yourself. There's grace tonight to be able to get free of years of bitterness. There's grace tonight. There's grace tonight to say, I've been betrayed, but this betrayal will not frame out my trajectory. Grace will frame out my trajectory. I will not grow old to be a vindictive, bitter, resentful, old man. I will grow old with the love of Christ, with the joy of Christ, and the peace of the Lord. Bitterness will not frame my future. Forgiveness will frame my future. And joy will be my song, will be my lifestyle. Unto joy and unto hope I will live. And knowing that I had the right to damn you, but instead I forgave you and I released you of all judgment. No, for the believer, for the Christian, forgiveness is not optional. For the Christian, forgiveness is mandatory. That we have received so much grace. And now by faith, by faith, not by feelings, we say, I forgive you and I release you of all judgment. Would you stand? Are you willing to forgive tonight? Are you willing to live tonight? If you haven't forgiven, you're not living. It's a t-shirt. It's a bumper sticker. If you haven't forgiven, you're not living. Your present is being framed by a bitter root of bitterness. And tonight we're going to cut that root. Tonight we're going to cut that root. And the lies associated with unforgiveness are going to be silenced once and for all. As a pastor, would you forgive me for how I have sinned against you? If so, please respond back and say, Pastor, I forgive you. Go ahead and close your eyes. I don't want you to see me. I want you to see that man. I want you to see that woman. I want you to feel the pain associated with that betrayal. And this is what I want you to say with as much confidence and truth that you can muster up. Declare with me right now, and I release you of all judgment. Right here. Right now. Just let it go. Just release it right now. Release it right now. Release it right now. Some of you need to forgive. It's not a pastor. It's, it's a mom. It's a dad. It's an uncle. I forgive you. And I release you of all judgment.
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious. And oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just go ahead and hold out your hands, just receiving posture. Father, I thank you. I thank you that the pain associated with the betrayal is broken and that you are removing the venom that has been a part of people's hearts in this room for years. That you are removing the poison that was attached to this pain and the effects of this betrayal, the effects of this abuse are broken. Now, in Jesus' name, these effects include insomnia, heart sickness, gut problems, digestive issues being healed right now in Jesus' name, autoimmune disease being healed right now in Jesus' name, hallelujah, nightmares, night terrors being healed right now, I declare you are delivered right now, I said right now, I said right now in Jesus' name, flashbacks being canceled out right now. I said right now, I said right now, I said right now, being broken, shattered right now, in Jesus' name. The fear of the future being broken right now, in Jesus' name. Even the spirit of suicide being summoned into the courts of the Lord and judged on your behalf right now. I hear the Lord say that the spirit of suicide 
has now been rendered useless in your life and no longer has authority within your soul, I declare you are free. You are delivered from those thoughts that you no longer want to live. And I see the Lord issuing a fresh life assignment right now in Jesus' name. I see someone here, you had an expiration date written on you by the devil, and he has convinced you that you're going to die, and he has written an expiration date. But I got something to tell you. The devil's a liar, and he wrote a lie on you, and that there's no power associated to that date. I'll say it again. There's no power associated into the devil's mockery. You will not die, says the Lord. You will live. And the Lord says, I have redeemed you. I am restoring you. And I have set a new date on your life. And this is what the Lord says. Even though you have walked in the shadow of death, you'll never die. For he has brought you into a fresh assignment of not just life, but life abundantly. And that place of stepping out of perishing and stepping into prosperity. In fact, if that's you, I'm not even going to look. I want you to step out of that death assignment and expiration date. And I want you to step into your new life assignment right now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. 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 Listen, for many of you, you've been unable to engage the call of God on your life because you've been chained to a disappointment that's been like a massive boulder that's kept you from growing. It's kept you from moving on. So some of you, it's like the rest of us are in 2022, but some of you are still chained to 1987. You're still chained to 1992. You're still changed to 1999 and 2000 and 2001. And let me tell you something. Jesus is taking an ax tonight to those chains. And he is radically setting you free from all trauma that has tried to bind you to the past. And the Lord says, I am breaking those chains tonight and now nothing no longer can bind you to the past because I am liberating you into the present and into the future. I am about to install you into a fresh call, into a fresh assignment, says the Lord. I am about to awaken you to your destiny. And many of you as a sign and as confirmation of the power of forgiveness and your decision to move forward, many of you are going to get new opportunities for new jobs, promotions, that some of you might even get an opportunity even to move in the natural to a new location. And it's significant because as it is in the natural, so shall it be in the spirit. And I just see that some of you, it's going to be like that place of Joseph after being in the dungeon. It says that he came up, he changed his clothes, he shaved, he prepared himself to meet with the king. And I see that many of you, even your appearance in the natural is going to change radically because you are in a season now being liberated from the dungeon and you are now making your way to the palace to meet the king. I declare that as a result of your choice to forgive tonight, God is now able to step into situations that you thought would never change. And not only is he able, but he is going to fulfill his word within your life. And he is going to accomplish what he started. Hallelujah.